Jamie, good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. How you doing? I'm all right. I think uh, last time we did this was in your front room. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Oh my god, forgot about that. Yeah. Pre, pre Bit nicer now, isn't it? Where you are? Yeah. Pre pre COVID, so lots happened since then. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's guys a long time ago now. Yeah, and it's uh, and you've bought a football team in the meantime, I've so lots team, changed. Yeah. <laughs> lots changed. And we have got Danny with us. Danny now yeah. travels with the show. Yeah. Great to see you, Danny. Good to see you. Were you producing the show when Jamie was on it? Yeah, yeah. That was the last time Remotely. we did it on Defiance, though, rather than what Bitcoin did. I think we did a bit of both, didn't we? We did both, yeah. Because yeah. I'd also, re- I, I was really into radical political movements, crypto anarchy as well, done a lot on that. And you, I think you were really suddenly getting into all of that as we, well. That was like, a book you'd written, we covered. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And, and then, but we did the one coin scam as a, as a show on its own on mm-hmm. what Bitcoin did. It was a popular show. Yeah, all right. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah I thought you time. meant the crypto queen was a popular show. Well, we know that's a popular yeah. show. It's BBC. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah. As I said, I was at your book signing. It wasn't really a book signing, though, was it? No, it wasn't a book signing. So tell the story. Where was this? Well, it was at the Acceler- – what was it called? The Accelerator event. It was. It's in sort of central London, sort of city. Yeah, one of um, those kind of uh, buildings where lots of really fashionable, cool people work and you've got no idea what they do for a job. <laughs> Yeah, that's it, exactly. And yeah. actually, I was doing a talk about OneCoin, and then the organiser said to me, we've actually got quite a controversial host of the event after you. He's called Peter McCormack. <laughs> and I was like, I know Peter. <laughs> Why were you controversial? Uh, I, I actually don't think they fully appreciated what they asked me to do and how it was going to turn out. Cause... You were chairing a kind of debate, weren't you? Well, so it, firstly, it was... Jamie given a talk, an update on, uh, wait, correct me if I'm wrong, but as an update on the missing crypto queen, because your book's out now. Yeah, that's so it's it. A talk, yeah. It's like a, he's basically on a book tour, right? Yeah, and, something like uh, that. And had an interview with a guy about it, gave an update, and then they wanted to follow it up with a kind of debate about uh, crypto. As and such. trust. And trust. And they asked me to share it, to chair it. And then they obviously sent me through the list of people who were on the list, and it was just... Uh, there's a, like a guy from Bitpanda, but basically a bunch of shitcoiners. <laughs> and so anyway, they, they they got us all on this call beforehand to try and prep it. And, and the girl who was prepping it, she wanted to say, she was like, what are all the questions we're going to ask? And I was like, it doesn't really work like this because in the environment you want to ask questions. And, and she was getting really nervous. And I said, look, listen, I'm going to be honest with you because like this is what I do. It's my job. So I'm just going to turn up and ask questions. And even if I agree with you, them with you in advance... I'm probably just going to change it. So you just got to accept, I'm just going to turn up and do it. Or you can just like remove me from it. And she said, no, okay, you do it. But like, just don't get me in trouble. <laughs> and then maybe, basically, I, I, I definitely upset a few people. It was, the, it was the Peter McCormack show, basically. It was, it was, no. <laughs> but a lot of people were there to see you, I think, as well, because, you know, they all listened to the podcast. And I think in the end as well... It, you go to hundreds of events about crypto and trust and this, that and the other, and Frank, like most of them, you don't remember anything. Mm. At least people would remember because it got a bit heated. You it were did. saying like, you're all a bunch of shit coiners. <laughs> well, <I was laughs> not, not in those words, but you know, you were sort of cutting through some of the crap. Yeah. Uh, it was brilliant. People well, loved it. Do you know what it does? We spoke about this on the way. I don't know if you remember, in the interview we did the first time, I said there's different levels of scam because... There are certain people who call everything a scam. If it's not Bitcoin, it's a scam. You know, even to the point of people's it got ridiculous. Owning a chair is a scam. You should sell it and buy Bitcoin. Like, but there are different levels of scam. There are outright obvious scams like OneCoin, where there is no blockchain, it's never gonna exist, it is just theft. It's designed originally to be a multi-level marketing pyramid scheme, basically. Exactly. Using crypto as the branding. And that there, there's lots of those that exist in crypto, let's say crypto wide. Then you've kind of got what I would say is like a semi-scam where they have got a blockchain, they're promising it will do something, they sell a bunch of tokens, pre-mine them, sell them off straight away, N- nobody ever, ever, ever makes any money yeah. unless they're in. Then you've got what are just shitty ideas. Yeah, totally. Which may be you know, something like, I would say Solano is just a shitty idea. So, now, some people call that a scam, some people say it's a shitty idea. Um, I say it's a shitty idea because it's not decentralized. It keeps stopping. And then you've got other things like Ethereum where I think it's a genuine attempt to do something. Like there are people who genuinely believe they can build useful applications on it. And also, even though I hate it and I wouldn't use it or I don't like it, there are things, useful things on it. There are pe- I've just read an article about people in Argentina who are using Tron which some people call a scam, but they're using the dollar stablecoin on there to protect their income because yeah. the peso is yeah. so fucked. 
So I find it hard to call that a scam when it's actually yeah. supporting people's lives. And you go all the way up to Bitcoin, which some people actually yeah, call a scam. Yeah, yeah. But there's yeah. all these different levels. And my problem is, is the further you go, to go down the scam, the more I think they use something like Bitcoin and blockchain as a cover for it actually being a scam. And you know, I only care about Bitcoin. So when I was in that environment, you had these people talking about blockchain solutions, for blockchain for voting. I was just like, I just want to go and say, look, it's all nonsense. Convince me otherwise. So I was a bit... That's a bit mouthy. <laughs> that sounds like you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very true, though, about the layers of scam. It's really important because I think we talked about this before. The problem for the OneCoin investors who did not understand any of the tech of any of it, but like they weren't crypto investors at all. They just had heard about Bitcoin in the newspaper or something. And they, their friend told them that they're in on the next big thing. If because they just would look around and see everyone calling everything a scam. Yeah. So when people would call one coin a scam, they'd be like, yeah, but whatever, you call Ethereum a scam. So what's the difference? So that's why the language is quite important about like, that's a pump and dump scam. This could be accountancy fraud, not actually really a scam on an exchange site. This could be, you know, a good idea, like you said, but that's or a bad idea, but that some people do believe in. That's not quite the same. So you, you got to be really precise with the language on this. Otherwise, it ends up unfortunately, sucking a load of people into actual scams. We were talking on the way because we re-listened to the last two episodes. Just as the a new refresher. ones. Yeah, as a yeah. refresher. Yeah. And Frank Schneider was on there. Yeah. And you had that moment with him where you were asking yeah. about how did he not know? Come on, this is common sense. Uh, and Danny was at that point in agreement. I said, let me tell you something. If I launched one coin and I called up my dad and said, look, dad, I'm doing this project. I need your help. Can you help me with it? And he said, yeah. I said, look, I need a manager. I need you to manage my diary, you know, to book my hotels, to do all this stuff for me. Will you come and work with me? My dad would say, do it. And, I said, and he would probably travel with me and do those bookings. And even at the point where I could explain it to my dad, he'd be like, oh, that sounds great. And even at the point where things were in the, say there was in the press, things saying, Peter McCormack's a scammer, one coin is a scam, stay away from him. And if my dad came to me and said, what's this all about? I'd say, no, dad. These people are jealous. Haters. They don't understand. <laughs> the reason I'm increasing the supply by 50 to 1 is because there's massive amount of demand. And he'd be like, oh, okay. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> now, I'm not 100% sure I believe Mr. Schneider, but I, I think you can get caught up in something without knowing you're caught up in something because it's so obvious to us because we have the knowledge. And the reason I'm saying this is that everything that happens with these scams makes my life as a Bitcoiner harder yeah. because I'm trying to explain a tool which is used for human rights, it's used by activists, it's used to route around capital controls and authoritarian states, used by people for me to pay, uh, suppliers of them to pay me across bound, uh, borders. Also, some people do invest. There's like all these uses for Bitcoin. And more often than not, with everything that's happened, say now with FTX, yeah, you know, Celsius and three hours capital, it all gets lumped in together. Yeah, that's right. And trying to navigate that is a bloody nightmare. Yeah, it, it definitely is. I mean, the Frank Schneider interview was really interesting because for anyone that doesn't know, Frank Schneider, the Ameri Frank Schneider is a former top spy for Luxembourg. He's a you know, he's a top European Union spy. He was director of operations at SREL. And in Luxembourg, they do sort of specialise in a lot of financial crime as well, given where they are. So we're talking about someone that really knows how to spot deception. And he is in the process of being indicted by the Department of Justice in the US for his role in the OneCoin scam for money laundering and wire fraud. Wasn't wasn't he actually indicted today or yesterday? It was a new indictment was yeah. published. It, it was it was a superseding indictment. So he'd already been indicted. He was arrested to great fanfare in France. He's under house arrest at the moment. And then a new indictment for reasons I don't really understand actually why they put a new indictment out. But a superseding indictment was yesterday. I think it was. It came out. So they want him, and he's, he's got one more appeal left to run. But it looks likely he will be indicted. Um, but I suppose that interview was interesting because he was under house arrest when I interviewed him. He's got an ankle bracelet on. It was a really weird thing to do. But the very specific thing that I was, for me, was most interesting about that is I said, Frank, you know, you're a spy, you're trained in deception, and you, how comes you didn't spot this? Oh, blockchain's complicated, it's confusing, I don't understand the technology. All right, leave that to one side. That's your dad's argument. I mm. understand that. But I did say... Not you're just you're increasing the supply by a factor of 50 because Ruja 
built a new blockchain and she increased the supply of a, by a factor of 50. She said the price is going to remain exactly the same, five euros 95, which to me, that would obviously, that's real alarm bells. And he said, but it's all, I don't understand any of the technology. And I just thought it's not really about the technology though. Was this not very, very suspicious general behaviour for you as a spy, for someone to have done something like this? Isn't this basic economics? Wasn't this enough to make you really concerned that maybe this, the price of one coin was just fixed and fake? What was his job for her? Different people say different things. I mean, technically he was brought in as a kind... He, he ran a private intelligence company called Sandstone in Luxembourg. So he was kind of managing her sort of some of her security, some of her PR and reputational stuff. But he's often described by others as a sort of all-round fixer, you know, someone that sorted things out for her. I don't really know what that means exactly, to be honest. But it was just a good example for me of where sometimes people allow themselves to be baffled by the technology. They what? don't look at the fundamentals. I mean, it's a multi-level marketing company with a price that Rouge seemingly can just manipulate at will for a product that a lot of people are saying is fake. To me, that is enough for a professional person to say, I think I should probably step away from this. When are you a co-conspirator, though? You know, I'm trying to trying to see yeah. both sides. I'm trying to trying to be yeah. as most chariti charitable as I can to him, because yeah. to me, she's obviously the master criminal, one of maybe a few master criminals. Now, if his job is security yeah. and he's arranging their security, and there's an announcement yeah. about this increase in supply and he just doesn't read it because he doesn't care. You know, yeah. I mean, I'd, look, if I had to put my gut in there, he probably knew what was going or on. Or had questions. I mean, the yeah. thing is, it's a sort of strategic ignorance, I think. Sometimes people just don't want to ask certain questions. Especially when if you're being well paid. When you're being well paid, exactly. And that is what people like Rouge do and what they understand that you pay someone a lot of money, they won't always ask difficult questions. When is someone a co-conspirator? I mean, look, Frank Schneider hasn't been charged or found guilty yet, so or hasn't been convicted of, of any of this yet. So let's see. I mean, and he is, but he is being charged with money laundering offences and wire fraud. So they, the FBI, are alleging that he was somehow quite actively involved in the promotion of this, in making this company really function, and moving money around for Rouge and concealing its origins and purpose. So that's a slightly different thing for, from Frank, you should have known. That's not mm. really so much of an, uh, a question of legality. That's more a sort of moral question. Like, Frank, come on, you, you should have got this. Like, why did you miss this? Mm. With I mean, everything, look. all your skills and experience. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying that just his ignorance was criminal. There are other charges that he's got. But I think in law they talk about known or should have known. Like, with the weight of evidence and the information you had, you should have reasonably known what was going on. Mm. But I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really answer that properly. I mean, my suspicion is he knew, or he was being ignorant, but I'm just more inter interested at the point you become what you're doing as criminal. And I guess, like, if you're moving large amounts of money around, you have to be aware of, it, aware of where it's coming from and where it's going to. Yeah, and that's a separate thing, isn't yeah. it? That's the sort of money laundering charges. And that is... In the case of one coin, that seems to be what the Department of Justice is most interested in. They don't really seem to go after the top promoters, the people that have been pushing one coin and selling it to people all around the world. But they've gone after Rouge's investment manager, who they've done on money laundering charges, Frank Schneider. They're going after him on money laundering charges. They really... Her brother? Her brother, money laundering and mm. fraud. He pleaded guilty to, to those charges. So they really go after the money launderers in these things. I mean, they see their role as upholding the integrity of the financial system, don't they? Do you so, think there's a possibility it's that th these are the people that will give them the best chance of getting to her and one may roll? Well, the, yes, definitely. I think the general thinking on this is that her brother, I mean, at the moment they've got her brother. He's pleaded guilty. They've got her lover. He's pleaded guilty and works with them. Her investment manager, he was found guilty, although he's um, appealing, he's asking for a retrial. Her co-founder of OneCoin, Sebastian Greenwood, he is awaiting charge at the moment. He's awaiting trial at the moment. Um, and now they're going after her senior advisor, Frank Schneider, this Luxembourg spy. These are really the sort of top people. Hmm. It's just her. She's the only one left. But the big thing that's happened since we spoke is that that the FBI put her on their 10 most wanted list, which 
shows they really do want to get her. What was it? A five thousand dollar reward? Which <laughs> no, that was the Europol. Yeah, <laughs> Europol put her on the Europol put her on their top ten most wanted list or their most wanted list. They don't have a top ten. Their most wanted list, and then about two weeks later, the FBI puts her on their most wanted list, and but they offer a hundred thousand dollars reward. But when we saw that, five, we heard that five thousand dollars were five thousand euros. We're like, huh? Yeah, that's a bit weird, isn't it? But the thing is, that even the $100,000 reward from the FBI is an interesting number because they know, like, if she's being protected by some wealthy oligarch, they know $100,000 isn't going to mean anything. Mm. What I think they're going after are people that work in the ports in the in the Mediterranean, the people that work in the shops that might have spotted her, the people that work on yachts and boats, you know, the catering crew or whatever, people for whom $100,000 would actually make a real difference in their lives and would be enough for them to basically quit their jobs and disappear for a while. So that's why I think they've chosen $100,000. I asked the FBI about it because I interviewed mm. them for it. Um, and they sort of hinted at that. But she is now, is she the only crypto scammer on the FBI's list? She's presumably the only crypto scammer that's ever been on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. I, I so. Yeah, I would have thought so. I mean, she's not the only one under the... Uh, Investigation by the FBI. We'll talk about that one later. Yeah. Do you know what we should do? Sorry, because it was. I mean, it was two thousand and nine. But when you were 19, last on the yeah. show, two thousand. Sorry, two thousand nineteen. <laughs> two thousand nine was when Bitcoin was uh, released. Uh, two thousand nineteen. So it's been a while. We've got a few more listeners now. I bet some haven't even heard yeah, of yeah, Bitcoin right. or know what it is. What's the just like a quick TLDR the, on it yeah. all? The quick story is Dr. Ruja Ignatova comes out of nowhere in twenty fourteen and says, "You've all missed Bitcoin." And Bitcoin's for criminals and anarchists like Peter. You know, it's not going to be for ordinary, non-technical guys. It's you know, drug dealers and all the rest of it on the dark net. So I've created something better. It's called OneCoin. It's really simple, easy to use. Bitcoin's got this decentralized blockchain, which means it's never going to be controllable. But I've built a centralized blockchain so I can reverse transactions and stuff like that. The irony of that statement. <laughs> I know, but what you've got to remember is that for ordinary people, that kind of does make sense. Yeah. Like my mum would immediately think, yeah, that's better because what happens when I get my Bitcoin stolen and they're gone forever? I don't want to, you know, I've forgotten my password. What am I going to do? So she was trying to pitch this to ordinary people, non-technical, non-sophisticated investors. But she also sold it through multi-level marketing. So like Amway or Herbalife. You know, you buy you you buy some one coin, then you sell it to your friends and family, and you get a commission. So this thing then just takes off so quickly. And by 2017, she's got a million investors from 175 countries who've put in over four billion euros into this. The price of one coin keeps going up, but she keeps saying it's not available to trade yet on Kraken or Poloniex or one of these, but it or Binance, but it will be soon. That day never comes. October 2017, she gets a Ryanair flight from Sofia, Bulgaria to Athens, Greece, and just disappears into thin air. She's gone with at least 500 million of investors' money. That's what her brother says, but it could be more than that. And she's been missing ever since. I mean, and really, the whole thing is just a pyramid scheme. But she'd put crypto in there to make it seem new and original and fresh. And she really, she captured all the hype of Bitcoin. Because every time the price of Bitcoin went up, these OneCoin investors would think, wow, I'm on the next one. Because they were so gutted they'd missed the first wave. And, you know, back then, $500, it did feel like you'd missed it. Felt too late. Shit. If the people that had invested in OneCoin in 2015 had put it into Bitcoin, they Rich. actually would have got the money Rouge had promised them. Mm. Weirdly enough. So she's been on the run ever since. Um, it's just a gigantic pyramid scheme with all sorts of sort of organized crime and money laundering angles to the story as well. But at the center of it, it's just this woman who built a very sophisticated scam and then disappeared with all the money. And then the FBI, you know, finally put her on the 10 most wanted list uh, just about three months ago. And there's a lot of victims around the world. Uh is there any particular example story of a victim that would kind of would be a good example to give to people of what people have been through? I know there's because we spoke to Jen McAdam yeah, yeah. a while back, and I know there's you know, was it I'm trying to remember the African the, country the guys in Uganda, Uganda that yeah. was it. Who particular yeah. any particular example or more, yeah, more than the, one? There's so many, there's so many, and you know the whole of the one coin saga has become a bit of an industry in its own now. There's documentaries being made, there's movies being made. It's really become a sort of a big story, if you like. 
the typical thing is the average investment was about 5,000 euros. And these weren't wealthy people. So 5,000 euros for a lot of them was their savings. It was the money they'd had, you know, the only real savings they had. Some people would remortgage their house. Some people would borrow from friends and family because they weren't interested with their 5,000 euros. They weren't interested in 10% annual returns. What good is that going to do them? They want to buy a Lamborghini. They want to go on holiday. Rouge is offering 300% returns immediately. You know, 10,000, you know, it's going to go the way of Bitcoin. It's going to go up 10,000% in a year. And that's what people are interested in. What would often happen is someone would invest maybe two or 300 euros. They would see the price of one coin was going up. They might even be able to get some of it out because they did have a clever internal exchange site where you could sometimes trade some one coin for some quote unquote real money. Sorry for the expression. <laughs> who was setting the price? Because there was no Rougia. market. No, so was she just was set, just changing, she was just changing the price will. whenever she wanted. <laughs> so it was just going up and up and up. Did it ever go down? It never went down. <laughs> it never went down. It just went, it was like if you, the FBI is actually posted a picture of the graph of the price and it's just a it's just a staircase it just Perfect. goes up and up and up and up <laughs> where can i get some <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um but typically and this was why people like Rouge are, are brilliant students of psychology more than technology that they would they understood that if you can give someone a small payout so their 100 euro investment did turn into 500 euros and they got that money back they'd immediately put 5,000 euros in straight away and that'd be gone for good so they were very clever, and I, I heard that over and over and over again. I mean, in Uganda, the guy I spoke to, Daniel, he he told his goats to invest it in one coin. His mother had then put her life savings, two and a half thousand euros, into one coin. I spoke to a former winner of the Eurovision Song Contest yep. in uh, in America, where she was from Israel originally. She'd invested, um, I can't remember if it was tens or hundreds of thousands, thousands. yeah, hundreds, yeah, yeah. Th hundred and something thousand dollars. Her husband, her, you know, the money that she got after her husband died. It's, I, I've even heard of people with, P, believe it or not, PhDs in finance that have invested money in one coin. Huh. A doctor from America invested nine hundred thousand dollars into one coin. You know, so it's everything from a very, very poor person in a rural village in Uganda. And when I was over there, I'd meet people. Everyone had heard of one coin in Uganda. It was so interesting. Because like, there's a real hype about crypto in those places. And sometimes it was a bit sad. All, all the exciting hype and the laser eyes and all the stuff that was going on here, you know, behind that, there's some victim in a small village in Uganda who wants a piece of the action and has lost his life savings of 500 euros. Mm. So it was, uh, it was tough, yeah. And, you know, the weirdest thing is this month, one coin events are still taking place. <laughs> so I've got Finland. this on here. Literally here, is it still being sold? Yeah, it is still being sold. Who's they, selling it for who? They have rebranded it as the One Ecosystem, so they've got a new name for it. There was there was meant to be an event in London this week. Monday just gone. But a load of the victims contacted the people that were hosting the event somewhere in London and they got it cancelled. In some ways, so I'd rather he went ahead to go and see who's involved. Yeah, I wonder, actually. Yeah. I was but, actually hoping to, to go there myself, but so it who's got cancelled. You say they are still selling. Who Do is you it? remember I was I had a weird phone call in season one, like the first season, with this guy called Cameron High, who I phoned him up and he started calling me unprofessional and all the rest of it. Oh, maybe. You probably wouldn't, yeah. yeah. He's still involved. He's still pushing it. Other former promoters are still pushing it around the world. And, and often, see, what... Okay, so it was it was being marketed in 175 countries. So in places like Thailand, they're still hosting big events. Like the regulators aren't doing anything about it. It's not really being stopped. So you can kind of the FBI can stick Rouge on their list, but over in Thailand, it's still going ahead as normal. But are, are these uh, like separate entities who have got individuals who are exploiting it, or is is there still a funnel to some yeah, top? Yeah, both, both. It's both. See, I think both things are happening. So the one ecosystem So it's kind office, of decentralised now, <laughs> 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 ironically. That's why it's so hard to control. <sighs> <laughs> so there is still a head office, the same office in Bulgaria, in Sofia, Bulgaria, that's still open. The one ecosystem, they're calling it, like I said, is this the website? Yeah, that looks you, like it to me. Do you know the me. crazy thing is, it says our cryptocurrency was designed for regulation, not speculation. Yeah. On exactly. the website. Yeah. Do you know what that sounds yeah. like? What's that? BSV. Yeah. It is, because yeah. that's what the BSV people 
started promoting. Start, and, and I think I'm okay saying this. Uh, one of the things that Craig Wright was been pushing is that you can, like, you should be able to return coins to people. Like, uh, your yeah. private key isn't finality. Uh, yeah. It doesn't prove ownership. So that's that's something yeah. that they push too. Wow. Yeah. Well, so so there there is still a head office. There is still that going on, uh, and money still funneling up the pyramid to the people at the top. But I also think that out in like a small village in Uganda, you'll still have promoters who are just going around knocking on doors, village to village, and saying, hey, "Give me some cash, and I'll give you someone. I'll send you someone, and I'll I'll open an account for you on the website." but we'll make it between us. So sometimes when you cut the head off a pyramid scheme, it can carry on because promoters could carry on exploiting people by using cash and sort of word of mouth. I wonder if someone's even created like a, a one coin token. Uh, maybe. Have a look, because I wouldn't be surprised because you it'd be very easy to create that as well. Yeah. So, God, there's so many places to go with this. Uh, so they still have an, uh, an office in Bulgaria. Yeah. Why have the Bulgarian authorities not closed this? Okay, down? well, I can speculate about this. Yeah, because if you've if you've heard the last episode of yep. the podcast, we find that Europol meetings where the Americans and the British and the Germans and the Dutch and the Bulgarians and the Dubai police were all there sharing information about OneCoin. They were investigating OneCoin. This is before she disappeared. The the meetings from those minute from the the minutes from those meetings, the PowerPoint slides from those meetings found their way to Ruja within days of those meetings happening. So we speculate that one way that happens is through the Bulgarian of officials at those meetings were somehow getting that to Ruja. So you, you, I, you're whispering it. We're just going to turn it up when we release it. <laughs> <laughs> just got to be careful with my words. No, no, be careful. And um, look, if you need someone to check it before it goes out, yeah. we're okay with that. But you see, so it's it's that, so that's... It sort of suggests that Rouge is very well connected in Bulgaria, and we sort right. of know that all along. But it's very mysterious how and who and exactly in what ways and who would be behind this because it's kind of well documented that Bulgaria is the most corrupt country in Europe. Okay. Critics say most countries have a mafia. In Bulgaria, the mafia has a country. You know, huh. it's quite a well-known place for organised crime and the government where they're quite intertwined. Corruption's a massive problem, and... I think the general belief is that Ruja had corrupted police officers, had some form of protection there, and it's possible that that is why it's still open, why it's still in operation, because mm. I don't understand it myself, why they haven't just shut this down and arrested everyone. Yeah, it feels like at this level it would need to go a bit higher than police officers, though. Yeah. Yeah, it's not just about individual police officers. I mean, mm. there's all sorts of allegations that I can't really repeat because... Yeah. It's, it's, do you know why it's... It's so hard to stand up allegations against named individuals when it comes to sort of rumours of organised crime and stuff mm. because you, no one talks, no one tells you anything. This is one of the reasons our investigation into it is a little bit stalled because like, we need to go to Bulgaria again and I'm pretty worried about that given the last thing that we reported on with this Europol thing has caused a bit of a stink over there apparently. It was in all the news about... Someone in the police is leaking Europol things to Ruja and there was pressure on the government and they weren't answering questions about it. So I've got to now turn up there and they'll see when I arrive on the flight list. And I'm thinking, well, what's what you know, what's gonna happen? How so many people were in that room, do you know, in that Europol room? There were different meetings, but usually about twenty or so. So potential candidates are people in the room, but then also there's potential candidates oh. who are people who just move files around, yeah, have access that's right. to files. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, very mm, okay. So but, you know, it's it just make it just makes it again because we've always wondered like why is Rouge so confident? Why did she disappear just before she was about to get arrested? Well, she was having access to these meetings. Hmm. So the the organized crime part of it is interesting. I've got a few questions about this for you, but one thing I keep thinking about is is she in a position where she's now buying protection? And even if that is a case, at the point where you've bought protection of very kind of scary and dangerous people, yeah, does there come a time where they then own you? Yeah, and you know she needs to be kept protected, and maybe it turns to where it's an exploitative relationship of hers. Like, yeah. no, give us the money. I know. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, again, I can't bed with the devil. They, I've spoken to a lot of people about this, and it's a bit of speculation because yeah. I, I can't see exactly what's going on and who's exactly behind it. Although the rumour has always been that this one individual in particular called Tacky, the the he's the considered to be the most notorious Great name. drugs trafficker of all time, the cocaine king, they call him, the nickname, the cocaine yeah. king, that he's somehow involved in this. I mean, he lives in Dubai at the moment. He's someone that's known to have been close to government as well somehow. So this is these are the sort of circles we're dealing with. Um, the question has always been, and I think it's the question the FBI also has as well, did Rouge start this out with organised crime somehow involved? Like a big plot to launder money and, to, you know, it's just a clever way of making money for them and for her as well. Or, and this is the one I think is more likely, did, did one coin get very big very quickly and then organised crime groups in Bulgaria turned up and said, Hello. Hi. Yeah. How about we run your security now and how about you launder money for us and in exchange we'll make sure you're safe? That, to me, feels more likely knowing Rouge's background than how OneCoin started. I think that's what probably happened. Right. And then those would be the people that would help her disappear. But she'd have to keep paying them to keep her protected. And I spoke to someone the other day about this saying, she's now on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. I mean, does this not mean she's more of a liability for people that might be protecting her? Because if they're looking for her, they might find other things. Well, yeah, exactly. Now the FBI have really got their heart on it. Like, because the, once you get on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, the FBI don't want to be made to look stupid. Like, they don't put people on there unless they think they can find them. They've got a strike rate of about, I think it's over 80 or 90%. They wow. find most people because they put, I think they put them on there when they know they're going to find them. So, because otherwise, why would you put someone on there that you'll know you'll never get? You look stupid. Mm. So suddenly the FBI are nosing around and all the powers that they've got to do that. It gets harder to keep someone hidden. And again, like you say, like the people protecting it don't really want the FBI snooping around their business. But if there's so, no new money coming... so Well, I, so I'll just say that yeah. he said it just will get more expensive for her. Yeah, It's not that they would get rid of her. She just has to pay more. So she... they. She has to be in control of the money. She has to still have access to millions of dollars to keep herself protected. And that is going to get harder and harder and harder to do, I imagine, with the FBI now really onto her. So I don't know. There's a lot of rumours around. There's mm. rumours that she has been killed. There's rumours that, you know, I, I, my last theory on this was that she was floating around on a boat in the Mediterranean, often on land. But is that now still true? The FBI is on to her? I don't know. There's a rumour she's now a man. There is a rumour that she's now a man. There's. Uh, oh, I've heard every rumour. Yeah. I've heard every rumour. I mean, rumoured that she was around London a lot as well, but never been able to... I've had lots of... I've, the funny thing is, people are absolutely convinced they've seen her. I get phone calls all the time. I, I definitely saw her. She was in Heathrow Airport. She was. I saw her in the car. I saw her here. She's in a shopping centre in Australia. She's somewhere else. People are absolutely certain it's her, but the problem is a lot of people look like Rouge. That happened with Madeleine McCann. Yeah. That yeah, happened with yeah, Tupac. Yeah. Tupac. <laughs> yeah, with Tupac. Tupac. Yeah. yeah, you know, that yeah. happens. And Lord Lucan before that, I guess. Yeah, the, although the, the Aston, silver Aston Martin with the number plate was kind of interesting. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. On, the, on the organised crime thing, Yeah. and you might not want to talk about this, so if you don't, I uh, understand, but how much consideration do you have to make for yourself right now? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I feel like I'm in quite a difficult position with this because I I really want to get to the bottom of this story, obviously, and I feel like there's a lot of expectation for me to do that. I'm lucky that I've got had millions of people listen to this podcast, are interested in the story, reading the book, all the rest of it, and, and they look to us to be the ones that are going to solve it. But I don't want to get myself killed for it. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I don't, I, as much as I want to find her, I don't want to end up. See, I see it slightly differently. Like, like as a mate, I, you know, want you to be okay and I want you to keep doing good investigative journalist work. But at the same time, I think the only reason for you to keep doing it is to create more entertainment for people. But, like, this is now in the hands of the right people to solve it. We've got the resources to do it. So I don't think you should feel any obligation yeah. to carry it on. It's not an obli it's not so much an obligation. I, I guess I feel very lucky that that so many people want to listen to our investigation. Yeah. 
and there's a part of me, obviously, having done it for so long, I just want to see it resolved. Mm. If I'm perfectly honest with you, it's a bit frustrating for it to be up in the air all the time, like constantly hanging over me. Where is she? What's happened to her? I would be so happy if I got a phone call tomorrow saying, the FBI have got her. You can, it's over. Mm. And I can go to America and sit in on the trials, watch them unfold, and I don't have to worry about it anymore. And I can, I'll move on to something else. Mm. But all the time it's out there and she's somewhere, I feel like it's, it's sort of annoying for me. Dedicated so much of my life to it, I can't really just easily walk away. So I'm trying to walk the right, you know, walk the tightrope. I'm not just going to walk away because I'm scared. Yeah. But I, I, there's probably places that I'm not willing to just rock up in Dubai, start banging on doors. No, it's unnecessary it, just, risk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we're trying to figure it out. I mean, at the BBC, you've got great security advisors and they'll say you probably shouldn't go here, but you probably are all right going there. And so going back to Bulgaria, for example, it's a bit risky, but the way I see it with organised crime groups, and I don't really want to, I don't actually want to investigate organised no. crime groups. I don't. I just want to find her. Yeah. And they're like in the way of that. And so I don't want to, I, I like, if you're listening organised crime groups, <laughs> I'm not interested in you lot. Just tell, tell me where she is and that's the, the end of it. Yeah, this show's <laughs> actually quite popular in, in the uh, <laughs> underworld of Bulgaria. Right, that's good to know. Yeah. She might be listening. Well, it's only criminals that listen to Bitcoin shows. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the... Um, so, like, for example, part of the thinking is organised criminals are, are very, very clever business people. Mm. They're not stupid. It would be more trouble for them to get rid of me. Mm. They wouldn't want to do it. It'd be mm. idiotic. And they're smart people, so they probably will leave us alone because why would they want to draw more attention to themselves? So you think, okay, well, that's good. That's quite safe, so I feel confident with that. But, it, yeah, it is a bit, I mean, bit nerve-wracking. Mm. Have you received any threats? Nothing, nothing serious, nothing serious, no. I'd like to tell you that, I, you know, that I have and I'm really brave, but no, they just, I just sort of get left alone, left to get on with it. Yeah, I mean, look. Is Paranoia that... in your head, though, isn't it, sometimes? Yeah. It, it can freak you out in your head. You can imagine all sorts of things, and that can be just as just as scary. Well, look, I, listen, I mean, I listened to the original series and we made a podcast and that was great, and then I've listened to these two additional ones, and honestly, on the way down, when we re-listened to it, I was, like, just thinking more of a, you know, as a mate, like a... You know, this, there is some serious people involved, and yeah. I just, on a personal perspective, I don't think there is an obligation. But what would you do if you're in my position? Just walk away and leave it? No, it's. I'd put it a different way. I think if you felt like walking away, there should feel there shouldn't be any guilt. Yeah, I just don't think. I, look, I went into the Venezuelan oh. slums without security because <laughs> I found it exciting. Yeah. Um, uh, I think you should do whatever you want. That's yeah. it. That's it. You, if you want to carry on, carry on. If you don't, yeah. don't. But don't feel an obligation. You've materially contributed to the investigation, and if and when she is found, then you will have played a major role in that. I just don't think you have an obligation to the audience yeah. to find her. That said, I can imagine if I was you, <laughs> this is like there's a niche now. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's, and that's it's different. Just hanging around around me all the time. Mm. Everyone wants to know, and I want to know, and I want to know. I mean, I've been doing it for four years now. Imagine one thing for four years, <laughs> and it's so infuriating because <laughs> it could be any day. I could, I, every every now and again, I expect my phone to ring and someone say, "Oh my god, have you seen the news? They've got her. It's brilliant." And I'll be so bloody pleased because I feel like I, 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 you know, I could I could wrap it up. I kind of want the phone to ring one day and it's her talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd love that too. <laughs> but originally, I think my expectations changed because yeah. when we started this, I really thought there was a chance that we'd find, like, you know, tap on the shoulder, get a sighting of her. But now with everything that's happened, I've, I've got to be realistic. I'm not going to knock on a door and she's there. I'm not going to spot her in a building somewhere. So it's more just, I suppose, just working out what we can now do without getting ourselves in serious danger. And there's a lot, there are a lot of things we can still do. Is it a case that the more you investigate, the more information you find, which gives you more leads, which starts to then make it feel even harder? Like, yeah, where do we bit. go? Yeah, a little bit. That is very true. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's, that's, that's a problem. You've got to know where to stop because you can follow this story in a million different directions. Um, so, yeah, you, and, and the, the reality is as well, for people that listen to this, 
they don't actually care that much about organised crime or money laundering because you've heard it all a million times. They just want to know, where did she go? Where is she now? You want to catch that's the baddie? That's it. Yeah, that's it. And I'm very conscious of that. So I could say, you know when podcasts go off on these little tangents and they're like, okay, let's do an episode and it's going to all be about organised crime and how it works. Mm. People don't care. They just want to know what happened to this woman. Mm. So I've got to be a little bit... Um, we're trying to only put episodes out now which are really about that, like getting closer to it. That, well, that was a good thing. It doesn't feel stretched out and people can do that and it could feel like, oh, here's another 10 episodes and yeah. you're really kind of dragging it out. And Although I did think, you know, when you made uh, episode 11, once you got the... Um, the, uh, memory the memory stick. stick. You could have ended on that because I was like, I want to know what's on that memory stick. <laughs> that that would have put, brought me into another episode. <laughs> yeah, but you've got to wait for ages and you'll have forgotten about it by the time yeah. it comes out. That's the thing. So where now? What now with it? Where do you go with it now? Or is that like, do we have to wait? You have to wait a little bit because of all the things I've said. Right. We've got to work out what we can say and what we can't say. Basically, the way we left it is we went to interview this guy, Frank Schneider. He's under house mm. arrest in France. Um... He gives us a memory stick and basically says, this is this has got the answers. This is going to help you find her. It talks about loads of other stuff that we haven't really gone into. And, and we are still combing through that. Three hours of... Here's one of the strangest things that for anyone that didn't listen, and the, 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 the whole story is very Netflix-y, I suppose. Mm. Dr. Rouge's boyfriend ends up working for the FBI and then records the phone calls that he's having with Ruja before she disappears. But what he doesn't realise is because of these Europol things, Ruja knows that the FBI are onto her. So she's recording the phone calls as well. And Frank Schneider gives us a memory stick with three hours of phone calls right up to the point she disappears between Ruja and her boyfriend. And we're still combing through all of that for little clues, but both sides, they both know that the others, you know, they both suspect... That the others recording the so the whole thing is so strange. There's loads of the other thing here is like loads of documents about companies and things like that. And who wants to listen to a podcast episode that's about Company X was owned by Person Y who owned another holding company in the British Virgin Islands? And that can also that can but yeah, but you say too that too much of that and it can get quite boring as well. So we're yeah. working through it all, trying to figure out how does this get closer to her. But in London. You did put up a slide about the structure of the companies. Yeah. And that was fascinating. But it's five minutes. Yeah. And maybe that works because we had the visual yeah. that you can see about yeah. this kind of crazy structure. I was thinking, one of the questions I had on the way about this all is like, is there, in terms of personal finances for me, right, at the end of each month I do my personal <laughs> finances. Right. And I've got bank account A, I've got this, bank account B, I've got this, savings, I've got that. And on my Bitcoin side, it's like wallet A's got this, wallet B's got that, wallet C. And I just know where everything is. I just keep an eye on, yeah, I know yeah. what it all is. Is there like a master account for where this money is? Because it's, it's <laughs> clearly distributed everywhere into assets, accounts. And if so, who manages it? Or is it separate? Like, I'm really intrigued to how she's managing the flows of those money, the flow, flow of that money and the pots of that money. Yeah, it's very complicated. I'm still trying to work it out myself, to be honest, because you've got all the, the four, let's say four billions invested. I calculated that about a third of that went back out in payments to the multi-level marketers. Ah, huh, okay. Because you got commission payments, so you're getting your ten percent for every one coin package that you sell. So she had to come up with a very clever way of paying tens of thousands of people every week the money they'd earn from selling one coin packages to other people. And did she pay that in dollars, or was she paying that in one coin? She paid that in sixty percent fiat and forty percent one coin. <laughs> The whole thing's really complicated. <laughs> so there was all of that she had to deal with and worry about. And she had, to, you know, accountants and all sorts of things. Her boyfriend owned a bank. And I think the boyfriend's bank was providing credit cards. But it's all very, very complicated. But then there was her own personal wealth. So she's buying houses in Sofia. She bought properties in Sofia. She bought a £13.9 million Ken Kensington penthouse. She had bulletproof Lexuses, all loads of cars. Then she had four $100 million British Virgin Island regulated investment funds. And the one coin money that the investors are paying in was ending up being 
disguised as investments from wealthy European families into these British Virgin Island investment funds, which were then going to buy other companies that Ruja ultimately owned, but none of it was in her name. And this was the way that she was turning some of the OneCoin money into sort of legitimate investments that she owned. And then she owned houses in Dubai. According to Frank Schneider, there's a billion euros still out there in bank accounts in China, in Dubai, in Australia, and I think South Korea. But I can't just phone up like Ch- the Chinese. <laughs> I mean, so there's the, you hit a brick wall when you're following the money. I know that's the journalistic adage, isn't it? Like, follow the money. Yeah, but when you, I can't follow it everywhere. So we're piecing it together and we're finding things here, there and everywhere. Like, I think she may have done something with online casinos in Malta. Uh-huh but you hit a bit of a dead end. I think she put money into a Luxembourg trust fund, but you hit a dead end. You can't get past it. You can't see anything more. So you piece together little things here and there, but more often than not, you just kind of, you you hit these like on paper owners that are, you know, very commonly she would have, a, a lawyer would own it for her. Yeah. So the person that was technically the owner of her London family office was a 27-year-old Cypriot woman and a former manager of Pizza Hut, also from Cyprus, who were registered to an address in Dubai. And they were the owners of her London family office. Where am I going to go with that? I mean, firstly, why don't... What do companies' house in the UK do about that? That's so dodgy looking. Mm. She like this multi-millionaire crypto genius, and it's a Cypriot, a Cypriot Pizza Hut manager who's the owner of her family office in London. Come on, but just no one does anything about it. Well, that's why I'm wondering: is there like a master accountant who's running the back office of all this? Who's run running the money flows? Who's managing the lawyers? Well, the gut. She was actually quite famous for trying to manage everything herself. Oh right, but she okay. was very very clever. I mean, she did She did work in finance for years and she got a PhD in law and, and she's a really, really smart person. But her, her American lawyer investment manager, Mark Scott, who was convicted for this, he was the one running those British Virgin Island investment funds. But then she would have had someone else doing another thing over here. She had some lawyers dealing with her property. She had someone dealing with her, her online casino. She had someone dealing with her Sophia house. It's a different lawyer. She must have employed at least 10 lawyers in different countries. Who Some of them were dealing with this, some of them were dealing with that. So she had, she had to kind of have a view on everything, but she had lots of people working for her managing the day-to-day stuff. And Why uh, are, you, are you interested in what you're going to do with all your money then? <laughs> because, I mean, no, but like, I mean, I have a very simple life. My finances are quite simple. I still have an accountant and a lawyer to help me out with it. Yeah. But it's quite super simple. And I'm just thinking it's like... Oh, the stress of it. The, well, the stress of it. Yeah. Well, so, we, uh, no, because I'm trying to think, uh, like, if you want to get away with it, one of the things <laughs> me and Danny were talking about the way down is like, if you're her, is, it, is, it actually, is this exciting and fun or is it just constant stress like is there an excitement of being on the uh, fbi's most wanted list getting away with it and are you just living this high life of parties and a yacht and people protecting you and you got your two fingers up or is it constant stress and- oh i think constant stress but so then- i i think i think i think at the beginning all the early parties and she had loads of parties and tom jones sang at a birthday party in london and then she had bebe rexa singing at a birthday party in bulgaria in 2017 you know, all these amazing cars and she had a big yacht and, you know, she really was living the high life. But she then had a daughter in October 2016 and she disappeared one year after. And I think the moment she had a daughter, it changed. It changed but she, it was stress. And it is, was is her daughter with her? I can't go into all that stuff, partly because I'm not sure. I don't think the daughter's with her. Right. But I, I really avoid too much talking about the daughter because the daughter's just an innocent yeah, party yeah. i mean it's, it's public record she had a daughter so i'm not saying anything super private she talked about it a lot but uh my suspicion is and from talking to people that might have changed it from being cool and fun and exciting to just being unbearably stressful but it was like too late by then could, could she also have exited in that she's got almost like a private version of witness protection she's gone and bought an id a location, and she's just disappeared. And yeah, we she's ask definitely about, done that. I mean, she definitely got ID. She definitely got all of that stuff. But what I mean is, that there's a version where she's still in the kind of like 
shadows of maybe Bulgaria and hiding oh, out there. And maybe she gets get a private jet to Dubai occasionally, and she's got the still they say people, or she's completely disappeared and it's gone to some people. And say, hey, I got five hundred million. I want to escape with 10, 15 million. I want an ID. I want to be in a country no one's going to look for me, like a, I don't know, south of Chile or yeah, up in Brazil has been yeah. mentioned often. And and I just want out. I don't yeah. want to be left and take all the money. Like that is an option because if it is all, all that st stress, because yeah. like I asked about that kind of master accountant, right? And the master accountant is somebody, one, who can steal your money, two, who can roll on you. Yeah. So do you have to have multiple, mar like yeah. you've got to have multiple you know, heads of this yeah. snake because one gets cut off. Yeah. Like I don't know how you do this. Yeah. And I wonder if she's just gone, I'm out, I'm done. She's very close to her family, though. Okay. So it's one thing about just disappearing and saying, all I want is a new ID, and I don't want to be involved with organised crime and this protection or that protection. I just want to live in a normal place somewhere far away from everyone with my new ID, and I'm gone. And she could have afforded that 100 times over. Uh, and that is possible. And maybe she did do that. I, however, have had a lot of sightings of her in and around the Mediterranean <laughs> right up until just... A year ago. The life she likes. The life she likes. And mm. I spoke to a private investigator. I was spoken to a lot of private investigators, and they said people always revert to type. Right. They, they end up back where they started. They end up like the lifestyle, the food, the glamour, the family, the people. They can't just, people can't just disappear. Or it takes a very unusual person to be able to do that. And that's not normally what happens. They normally stay close to the first place they went, which in this case is Greece. Mm. So this was this is our sort of work in theory, but it is possible. It is possible, and there are people that can make you do that. I've read I've read a few books about how to disappear because obviously looking into this, there's loads of books out there about how to do it. Well, we did this, <laughs> didn't we? So do you know the Quadriga story? Yes. Yeah. So we were looking into that, and we were looking to make a similar story to yours about that. Uh, what was his name? Gerald, Gerald Cotton. Cotton, yeah, and part of part of the way we were going to make it, I don't mind because we're never going to do it now. It's too, but we were going to try as part of the podcast to disappear, to actually disappear. You know, I, the only people I was going to let was my family and friends know, and then I was going to try and disappear. You know, it's a lot of work, a lot of planning. Oh, it's a lot we, of work. We looked yeah. at the books. I mean, I <laughs> I gave myself a year of prep before I could actually do it. Yeah, you know, siphoning bits of money away, and yeah, it's. It's, it's hard lot. work. Yeah. And you, one mistake, one mistake, you like lose discipline. I mean, that's the thing that all these books on disappearing say. You've got to have this eye and discipline. You make one phone call, you, you know, you make one little mistake, you appear somewhere in public for too long, you contact, you're desperate to contact someone so you just can't help logging into Facebook to just, that um, could be it. Yeah. And a lot of people have said to me, but she, it's impossible. She couldn't have done it. She'd be spotted, all the cameras everywhere. But why do we have an FBI's 10 most wanted list and a Europol's most wanted list? Go and have a look at them. Loads of people that have been on the run for absolutely ages. Mm. There was this British guy that stabbed someone in a bar in London, got himself a fake ID, travelled around Europe for about two years. Mm. All he did was got some tattoos and grew his hair long. No one recognised him. And then in the end, he handed himself in because it's so stressful. <laughs> Just constantly on the run. Mm. It's not fun no matter how much money you've got, the stress of it. So if she is out there, she's living in a golden cage because it would not be fun, especially not now she's on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. The, the thing that I thought when we were listening is um, Dubai seems like a place where maybe she could have she could be working with either yeah. royal family or the state or in some way yeah. maybe they're hiding it. Because do you want to explain what they did with the money? Because that's super interesting. Do you mean the, um, the sort Bitcoin of the, deal? The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. I don't – this is very, very complicated whether this even happened at all. And I'm increasingly wondering whether the whole thing is, an, is itself an elaborate scam within a scam. Mm. But it seems that at some point, again, long before she disappeared, Dr. Ruja had 50 million euros or so frozen in Dubai bank accounts, 50 million euros. And it seems that she struck a deal with a sheikh there, although I should say he denies all of this and claims he was the one that was wronged, um, but struck some kind of deal where... She hand, essentially handed the power of attorney over to him to have control over the OneCoin companies, including the bank accounts with the frozen money, the 50 million that's frozen. Uh, and in exchange, he handed her four memory sticks 
with 230,000 Bitcoin on them, which at the time was 50 million euros, because this is in 2015. The thinking being, Ruja gets the Bitcoin, and me, the Sheikh, with my, you know, the strings I can pull and my contacts, I can unfreeze your bank accounts and keep that money for myself. That all ended up going disastrously wrong. He wasn't able to unfreeze the accounts. He did send a letter or two off to like, you know, the chief prosecutor in Dubai, but the bank accounts weren't unfrozen. Then there was this big legal dispute between Ruja and him about who really owned it and had he overstepped his power of attorney and got very, very complicated. The latest ruling on this, which was just a few weeks ago, I think he now is probably in possession of that 50 million euros of frozen money. I think he has won... All these appeals were going on in the Dubai commercial courts about it, and he has won and now does own that 50 million euros. The question is, did he ever really give her 230,000 Bitcoin on four memory sticks? Mm. So, it, Any it, blockchain it, scanning no, to see the big transactions? Oh, yeah, tried it. Tried it, but it was all in on cold, you know, supposedly cold wallets, you know, just it's just a memory stick with access to God knows how many cold wallets. It wasn't ever said. I don't know if any of them moved. I had no addresses for any of those wallets. But this was presented in a Dubai commercial court, you know, like documents where the Sheikh signed it. Like, I handed Ruja these Bitcoin in exchange. Trust me, Gov. Well, you know, it could be that he just made that up to explain why he should have the 50 million that was frozen. And again, I'm like, how am I supposed to figure this out? <laughs> so um, she was sort of connected in Dubai. She did have a mansion there that we think we found. Yep. Using some open source intelligence That was an amazing work. part of the story. <laughs> so, you know, using just one photograph on Instagram of that our brother took, we managed to geolocate the exact place of this mansion that we think she may have owned, but she probably isn't there anymore. We sent some Krispy Kremes around there on like Deliveroo type thing to see if anyone was in, but no one was. So she had good connections in Dubai, and this Bitcoin thing was really annoying me. Like I couldn't get to the bottom of it. I like, did. We've got court documents that say this sheikh gave Ruja four memory sticks with two hundred and thirty thousand Bitcoin, and it's like maybe that we can trace there. We can use blockchain analysis. Yeah, to I mean, if I was out, the court, but... I was the court. I'd say, show me the evidence that yeah. you purchased and they transferred. And well, what they used was certificates. Like, look, here's like an affidavit kind of thing. Certificate of purchase. Yeah, I know, but yeah. this is old fact. This is the old. But that's like one way. coin. <laughs> There's no actual crypto. There's yeah, but this is the old-fashioned way of doing things, isn't it? I've got a document with a lawyer and have signed it, and there it is, and that's proof. Your world of proof is show me the keys, show me the money moving. Yeah. Show, but that isn't how courts really work still. So, to the court, I guess that was enough evidence. That was what they needed, and it comes down to these interesting questions about trust. Like, why do you trust a blockchain analysis or do you trust a lawyer's letter you know that's waved in the air at you i don't know if she even had it i don't know if it was a scam within a scam so the sheikh could get the 50 million so she was connected in dubai but because they fell out so badly i wonder whether she had to disappear again mm. from dubai because i think she was in dubai after she vanished right i you think, think that's I where think she one went. of the first places she went was dubai but i think she may have then had to have moved on again Getting from Greece to Dubai without a passport, how difficult is that? No, she had passports. She had loads of passports. But, but you would, they would have had... Oh, so it would have been a fake passport. I think she had fake passports, yeah. And is, has no one looked at the cameras at the airports? Or, yeah. yeah, the FBI probably has. Yeah. They're not going to tell me, are they? Care. Private... I mean, she travelled in private jets a lot there of the you time. Go. So this is why it's really difficult. And I... You know, we... Like, the, 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 the last known sighting was basically... Athens airport when she landed there on her Ryanair flight. And I said to, I asked the FBI about this. Was she definitely on that flight? You know, or because it could have been misdirection. Because didn't Jan Marsalek from Wirecard, you know, he pretended to be on one flight and then went off on another flight. And they basically said, no, we can't tell you, but we we're know. pretty sure she was on that flight. Let's just say that. Mm. So we know she was there, but from that point, it goes a little bit cold. And I'm sure the FBI obviously has information that I don't have about what happened then. And if you look at the country, look, if you look at the languages that they've translated this FBI notice into and the countries they've mentioned, Albania, Greece, Dubai, Eastern Europe, Balkans, Germany, they're all places that were kind of on our radar as well. Mm. 
Do you have a board at home with pictures and bits of string <laughs> that you stand and look at and go crazy no, with? people just do that in the movies. You that, didn't want to yeah, do that. Well, I did want to do that, but I made it as a podcast, didn't I? So what was the <laughs> point? The thing that was a massive red flag for me was that the last text message that I think she's known to have sent, I can't remember, who was that to? To Frank Schneider, mm -hmm. so and they, they says, used to speak yeah. in German, and then the last text message was home safe in English. Yeah. That seems like a huge red flag. Well, when well, you ever hear about a kidnap or a murder... <laughs> And the and the person who's done it keeps texting from their phone for a while. That just sounds like one of those. Yeah, the thing is, it's what's always difficult about this is, do I trust Frank Schneider? Mm. Was that true? Like every the funny thing about this story is, you never really know who you trust either. It always comes back down the whole thing about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin to bring it back to your mm. it's trust. Why do you trust the things you trust? Like, why do you trust money? Why do I trust Frank Schneider? Why do I trust the legal document in the court? Why did one coin investors trust Ruja? Like, Ruja had letters from lawyers. Frank Schneider trusted that. Why did he trust that more than the blockchain? I mean, and it's like everything is about trust in this story and why you trust certain things. And it, it does you head in a bit. Like, do I trust Frank Schneider? Is he lying to me about that text message for some reason? I don't know. I can't see the text message. Never, never showed it to me. Are there times where you've kind of got really then, well, you must have got very frustrated, feel like you don't know where to turn and like the whole thing's just becoming like a big yeah, jumbled mess? Yeah, that's how I feel at the moment. Oh, you, ha you do? Yeah, huh. yeah, I do. Um, and the, 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 I've got two things in my head. I mean, one is like, how do I make this into a story? How yeah. do I tell a story? Because that is what I do as well, isn't it? I'm, this, how do you draw a line through the chaos of this story? So... A listener, and this was always aimed at, I hate to say, ordinary people, but the whole purpose of us putting this podcast together was for non Bitcoin people to listen to it and think about it. And because you know how many people get scammed, you talk yeah. about it all the time. Yeah. How many people in the UK hold crypto assets? 2.3 million, or it's more than that now. That was the last figures. How many of them understand it, really, properly? Not many. Not many. I mean, I don't, and I've got a show. <laughs> <laughs> and how many are losing money all the time because they don't know what they're doing? So the point was normal people are more and more putting their money into crypto assets for lots of reasons, good reasons and bad yep. reasons. Can we issue a warning to them about how easy it is to lose it all, the risk of it? We so try. Part of my, yeah, and I felt like part of my job is I've got to make this story into something really digestible, easy, simple. I've got to line through the chaos, got to get people to switch back on. And that's a, that's almost like a separate job to can I do the hard work and find where this woman is? Mm. Have you dreamt the story? Yeah, yeah, dream about it all the time. Yeah, I thought you might. Yeah, all the time. It's bloody annoying. <laughs> but I, there Have was you found her in a dream? <laughs> There was that one time I mentioned it in the book where it was the day the podcast came out and this guy's smashing on my door at three o'clock in the morning saying, get the fuck out of there, get out of your house, banging on the door like this. This wasn't a dream. I was woken up, I thought it was a dream and I wake up and I think, oh my God, like these guys have found me already. What am I going to do? So I peer, I'm like, oh, to the one, this guy's banging on the door, get the fuck out of the house. And I'm like, oh man. So I phoned 999. So I don't know what to do, really. And I'm actually explaining to the police like that I've just released a podcast for the BBC and I think that they're on to me. And these guys are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Ask him what he wants. So I'm like, what do you want? Uh, he's at the wrong house. <laughs> <laughs> and that just made me so paranoid for the next so many months. So um, that was the closest thing to an actual dream because I, I was, thought I was dreaming for the first couple of minutes. I was like, what is going on here? But you know what dreams are like. They never help you. Never no. actually give you a clue. It's not like in the movies where you get this sudden waking up and a connection's formed in your brain between information A and B. It's never happened like that. No, I think it's more of a signal of, of how deep you are in a story. Like yeah. if you dream about it. I, like I know, like after my mum died, like there was a period I just dreamt about my mum all yeah. the time because it was consuming me. Yeah. You know, when I got divorced, I used to dream about my ex-wife because it consumed me for a yeah, period. Yeah, exactly. And when something's consuming you, it starts to populate your dreams. Yeah. And I just yeah. didn't know if you're that deep. Deep. Yeah, I am. I mean, to be, if I'm honest with you now, it's been so long that I, I have started doing other things. You know, I've had started doing other things as well because you've got to. Like, you don't get yeah. paid that well being a journalist. Let's be honest. So, mm. I've had to do other things as well, and I, and it's and it's it's not as all-consuming as it was. It goes in waves, 
like when we've got new episodes we're working on, it is nonstop and you become obsessed and you see Rouge everywhere. And the danger is when you're writing these stories like me, you get really obsessed with little details. I've got to get to the bottom of where that $100,000 went or what that one person did that's most people for the storytelling element don't care and you've got to try to remember that. So the problem is when you're obsessed with a story is you get in the weeds and you lose like what's more important sometimes, which is like what's going to make people carry on listening to this? Hmm. What's the big thing? And, I, and I've always found it really interesting. Like I know the story inside out and I'll go and talk to people about it and they'll come up or they'll come up to me and say, I love that story about that missing woman. Yeah, that, she's like that Bitcoin woman, wasn't she? <laughs> No, no, you'd like this, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, 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 not, not Bitcoin. No, but it was, it was one of them, wasn't it? It was like Bitcoin or something like that. And I'm like, oh, man, the level that people actually engage with these, it's so superficial compared to what you think. Yeah. So you've got to keep it so simple and so basic a lot of the time. Well, I had it recently. A friend got in touch. She was like, listen, my boyfriend's involved in a Bitcoin scam. Like, I don't know what to do. And she, uh, I was like, well, just send her across to me and I'll have a look and I can talk to her if you want. She anyway, sends me the link. It's just, it's like a one coin. It's just another scam like that no mention of bitcoin none of it anywhere but she was convinced it was a bitcoin scam yeah it had nothing to do with it which it does again makes our life so much harder yeah because she automatically thinks bitcoin is a scam yeah 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 i know and I, I did try in the podcast to really make that distinction yeah but the thing is like the problem i sometimes have is every event i go to someone says give yeah, a bitcoin's a ponzi scheme because new investors are just getting getting fleeced by the old investors and and they're paying they're paying the old investors essentially because mm. they're you get on a, you get in early there's nothing of any value and you just the old investors are selling to the new investors at a massive profit what's the difference so then you, know, you try and talk about that and why it's different yeah but it sort of drags you down doesn't it yeah. a little bit you don't get onto the interesting stuff but the thing i find most frustrating is the number of emails I get from people who say, my brother's been involved in a scam, my sister's invested in a similar thing to OneCoin, can you please look into it for me? And I can't, no. I can't. I, I, it's enough to do one crypto scam and focus on that. I can't look into all of them. But it makes me think that the police, that people don't bother going to the police. Mm. They're going to journalists saying, please, can you expose this scam for me? Because my brother feel bad now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's, it is a difficult one. Like, is it your job to do it? Yeah. A little bit, maybe, sometimes, given your position. But it's hard work to try and expose scams because it took me a long time to figure out what was going on with OneCoin, and that's a really simple scam. Yeah. When and people say you need to go and get into Tether, you need to look into Tether, you need to look into this one, you need to look into that one, I think, I just, my head hurts. I think I'm never going to figure it out. It's too complicated. Yeah, God. Yeah, I mean, we get asked all the time. Uh and there's, a, there's certain ones we want to look into. But, you know, you, sometimes also you, you've got to be very careful of the... Yeah, we talked about this beforehand. I'm not going to get into this now. But there are... You can end up in lawsuits. Yes. If you call something wrong, and, you know, and which is a really dangerous position to be in because it can... I mean, certain lawsuits can destroy your life. You have to yeah. be very careful. Even if not just financially, like mentally, oh, it's mentally, stressful. Yeah. And, and it's like... Unfortunately, people do use the legal system to silence critics, mm -hmm. whether it's crypto or anything else. And that had stressed me out a lot with the OneCoin story as well. Mm. Like a, a lawyer is going to complain about this or complain about that. And you got you do all your work as a journalist to mitigate against that as best you can. And, and I'm lucky because I've got the BBC, you know, the BBC's there as well. But for I know that for online critics of OneCoin, they got letters from top, London law firms threatening them, and it's very easy to roll over because you think, well, what's the point? You know, what is it worth my money, my life, my stress to do this? Mm. And unfortunately, wealthy people using the legal system to silence critics it annoys me so much. It's disgusting. Yeah, well, we've seen that with the oligarchs. That all that came to like threatening journalists. Um, there's been a, a lot of the Russians had an opportunity to come and hide money in the UK and buy expensive Kensington flats and Mayfair flats. And and buy... I understand why you people who are critics would just find it easier to just say nothing. Well, because of the stress you're put under. I mean, there was a one specific. I forget her name, but I think she might have written for the journal, uh, the Guardian. She wrote a book, and she got a lot of threats. Yeah, and, and yeah. then finally, she's been protected. But 
she still had to go through a very long period yeah during that to just of stress and cost to try and protect yeah. herself yeah and i yeah it's why i'm like such an advocate of free speech now yeah this is why i talk you know but when people say yeah but what about hate speech and i said well what, what about it yeah yeah there's more harm done by banning words than allowing words to be free there's more but, there's yeah. more harm done by that like okay there's a really good stand of a comedian he's talked about being offended he says okay you're offended then what happened yeah you know, we, we should, yeah. this is why I'm a big advocate now of free speech because yeah. I've been through a situation, I've seen situations where people are threatened and we need to have the ability to be able to call these things out. So yeah. no, I get it, man. Yeah, I know. Well, and also with social media, there's, there is the opportunity now to go out of your way to get offended, <laughs> but you can find it. And I think Christopher Hitchens has this quote, I can't remember the exact words, but where it's like, if people are determined to... Uh, you know, stand on a ladder and peer through their window so they can look at someone on the toilet and get upset by that. There's not much you can do about it. <laughs> and, you know, there is that sometimes sort of people sharking around social media looking for the chance to be offended about something and then for various reasons causing a stink about it. But they're not offended, really. Well, it, well no, not really. But I th- And I think that, I think that you, when, you've, when you've been on the receiving end of, like, being told you can't say something or being threatened to be silenced, you understand free speech a bit better as well and the value of it. Like you also understand it better probably when you're targeted by free speech and you get the sort of hate crime targeted at you. And I think a lot of people talk about it in the abstract and they've never experienced one, neither one nor the other. Mm. And I think once if you've experienced both, somehow you sort of get a better feel for what free speech is, why it matters where the limits might be. But a lot of us talk about it just in abstract terms. But I think more of us need to feel it to yeah. understand it. You know what I mean? And I, I feel like I've felt it. I've felt it. <laughs> you've definitely felt it. I've felt it. And then you become more of an advocate of that side of it. But if you're on the receiving end of loads of hate, you might, having felt it, you might feel a bit like, whoa, we need more limits on this, man. This is like I'm getting targeted. I'm getting attacked. If we can bring those sides together a little bit, but I'm, I'm with you. Like I err on the side of free speech always because... Just the the overall benefits to society are greater. Yeah, listen, look, I think society has established what words can and can't be said on a on a moral level. I think we've established that, okay? And there are social consequences for saying hateful words and hateful things to people. Yeah. I think society can deal with that. Yeah. But there are deep consequences from banning speech. Uh, protecting the people who you don't want protected. And, uh, you know, the UK is a shit show for free speech. It's one of the worst places in the world. Uh, I don't have the energy to fight it anymore. I've been fighting yeah. it for four years. But I, f- f- I know there are lawyers out there who are trying to fight this yeah. and because the UK has become almost an embarrassment of, of yeah. with our free speech laws. But we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a bigger... It's definitely a bigger thing, but it's interesting how it's sort of touched both of our our lives in different ways. Yeah. I mean, in, in the end as well, there is there is a danger more broadly about people go around being terrified of saying the wrong thing and getting targeted online because they've said the wrong word or getting cancelled for this or whatever it is. Um, are, we, we're not going to sort of develop the critical faculties ourselves to be able to really have these good arguments because no one wants to have them, no one wants to talk about things. And one thing that's really difficult for people at the moment is there's a lot of things that I see people saying online that I really don't agree with at all, but I don't want them to get like silenced. And, and, but you feel like you can't even protect, you can't even defend the person's right to say it without seeming like you agree with what they say. Mm-hmm. It's very hard to argue the principle of free speech. Like, I hate what you say. You know, I know the old cliche, yeah, I, but I agree I, with what yeah. you know. I don't defend your right to yeah. say it. But in practical terms, that can be quite difficult because you just think, oh, I just don't want to be uh, like tarred with the same brush as that guy because yeah. uh, that's going to look really bad on me. So, um, and that's uh, that's really sad. That's a shame. Well, it's it's anyway. the adapting to a world of social media, which is a whole other that's conversation whole other we can do but another I have time. Actually, written a book on as well. I know you have. <laughs> with, with, I think I think I interviewed you about that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, there was a whole other thing I was going to ask you about uh, with. Just a very short, short answer, really, and you 
we've had a lot of scams exposed right within our industry recently, specifically what everything that's gone on with FTX. And, yeah. Uh, this guy, Sam, uh, bank run Freud. Uh, bank, bank run Freud. Yeah. That's the news. Well, actually, it's, it's scam, scam, <laughs> bank run Freud or scam, bank man, <laughs> Freud. Like, there's all different versions, but I like... He's uh, got a good name for this, hasn't he? Yeah, it's all... Like, I saw a great meme on... <laughs> Online, and it was a bunch of lizards, and they're going, Yeah, and we'll call him the bank man. <laughs> God. <laughs> Scam but, bank run Freud. But, oh my God. I, I doubt you've been able to avoid seeing it yeah. and seeing yeah, yeah. what to me is not far off um, uh, one of the largest Ponzi's that's ever existed, not far off yeah. what Bernie Madoff did. Uh, yeah. Which, even if it was incompetence, a lot of it, it is still, <laughs> you've got yourself in a big hole. And we've seen somebody who hasn't been arrested, who's out there essentially on a PR tour at the moment, doing lots of interviews. Yeah. Just, I'm just interested in any perspective you have on this as somebody who has tracked an actual scam for the last four years. I can't believe he's doing it. I'm amazed that he's decided to go out there and do all these interviews and stuff because you've got hundreds of journalists now... Like the FBI will be watching his every word and they'll be looking for any evidence of things where he's lying or things that he said. And all these journalists are combing through it saying, well, he's just admitted to a fraud there without realising it. Oh, he's just admitted to doing this thing wrong. Oh, he sent 10 billion from this account to that account. Well, he should have declared that or should have declared a vested interest in Alameda Research. So why didn't... So he's... I don't know if he realises quite how risky it is what he's actually doing right, because of how the authorities and the, are going to look for evidence of in his own words because I guarantee he doesn't probably fully understand securities law or all the different things that you know are expected of accounting in a company like his because why would he? He should have advisors to do all of that. So he... I mean, probably at some point would have incriminated himself by saying mm. something. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm speculating. I don't want to say because I know he's not been convicted of anything yet. He's yep. not been charged of anything yet. So we've got a disclaimer. I do, disclaimer. I, I, yeah, yeah. So I do. Um, I'm watching it very closely. I've, I've always noticed how long it's taken the authorities to build a case up against someone. Well, that's it's the question. It's very, like... very long time because. The Why public, hasn't he been arrested? The public expect the police can just swoop in and get someone, but they have to build a case. And, you know, in the UK, you know, the police have got to build the case, take it to the Crown Prosecution Service. They've got to decide whether it's in the public interest to prosecute. And if there's enough evidence for that, that all takes ages. You don't just arrest. It's very unusual to just arrest someone immediately. And it feels like with what happened with FTX is the story really came out through the journalists. I don't know whether the... Department of Justice was across what was going on. So they might be scrambling to try and get evidence together at the moment. So it's hard to know. I did see some interesting similarities from the investor's perspective, like Forbes covers and, you know, like the credibility of, of someone who's got what highly esteemed parents and top names promoting or working for the company, advertising the company, Looks all very legitimate. Work with the regulators. Ruja said all of that stuff as well. Um, so there's sort of interesting similarities about why investors were just sort of pouring money into this. But, um, I mean, to, to me, obviously, the thing that seems strangest is the creation of the token and the ability to turn investors' funds into FTT, the sort of internal currency of the FTX exchange site, and then use that as collateral on loans and stuff like that. And it, this is where I sort of, a little bit like one coin, it's like, well, is that really crypto related or is this quite an old fashioned type of scam? And some people have said it's just, it's very old fashioned accountancy fraud rather than some mm. new crypto magic. But I, I think I get stuck at that because then I'm like, I'm out of my, I'm out of my zone here. I don't really know. I don't really know how, mm. what's expected inter for internal accounting requirements for this kind of thing in the Bahamas and all the rest of it. So it's hard to make a judgment on, on, on that. I think the interesting thing you've said there, though, is the fact that everyone's expecting an arrest straight away, but really they're building a case. Like, because that was my because the conspiracy I'm guessing. theory. I, yeah, no, I know. I've got to keep putting a disclaimer in because of how hard it's. But this, this is just what I would imagine because I just know for the one coins case, the, the you know the FBI were looking into this for like eighteen months and then she disappeared. 
So it, that's how long it was taking to because they don't want to bring a charge against someone and then they not have the evidence to stand it up. Mm. As you say, he's just really given up evidence at the moment. Like, it's why what, arrest him and then get lawyers involved and he might stop talking? There's no sign that he's going to run away. I imagine no. they wouldn't let him. And I, I imagine there's some difficult jurisdictions here, jurisdiction For issues sure. between the US yeah. and Bahamas. And they're still trying to figure out if the like, US entity is actually solvent and all that kind of yeah. thing. They, they need to know what's going on and it's not yeah. as easy as people think. I know, like podcasters might charge in and be like this is fraud and this is that and it's so obvious but you've got to prove it in a court of law and I, I, I'm, I, you know, I know how difficult those things know. are yeah and it takes a long time to build the case up for that so I don't know I'm, I'm guessing I'm guessing but yeah. that's what I, I imagine is going on well listen Jamie always a pleasure to sit and talk to you uh, I think you're doing amazing work and uh I think the success of this is 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 well deserved. It is a brilliant story, brilliantly told. Um, I've loved following it, and congratulations on the book as well. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, that goes into a lot more detail for those really interested in the inner workings of the of the one coin scam. Yeah, and we'll look forward to seeing what you do next because, uh, obviously, based on what you've done here, I'm expecting big things, and hopefully, <laughs> if it's with the BBC, they're going to give you a bigger budget, but we will see. But listen, correct, congratulations. If anyone listening wants to find out more about this, where do they follow the podcast? Where do they buy the book? Yeah, How you can get the you? book in the usual places, and for it to be honest, the podcast in the usual places. So they're both called The Missing Crypto Queen. And um, yeah, and, and similarly, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, an invitation to, the, to a to football match, so right, to see you're Bedford FC. Can't yeah, wait. Whenever you're welcome. Well, you uh, 17th of December is the next home game. Is it? We're trying to get a record crowd. So if you can come up to Bedford oh, on the yeah. 17th of December, okay. Let you'll me be see more, what I can do. I'd love more. to go. We've yeah. actually got a Bitcoin meetup before the game as well. <laughs> we could do a one coin meetup <laughs> before the game. But you'll probably lose if you do that. And you're on a, run, you're on a winning streak, aren't well, you? So well, you don't yeah. want to change it. <laughs> yeah, we had a streak of 13, I think, then we lost. And now we're on a streak of eight. So we've got to love keep it. that going. But listen, keep going, man. This is amazing. I'm sure we'll do this again soon. Okay. Thanks very much for having me.